when I look down... I Don Di Maria pretty there. much lives on the water. A commercial fisherman, he's been in the Florida Keys for 45 years. So the water out here, Don, actually, it doesn't look too bad. No, I mean, it looks relatively good compared to the canal we just came from, but you still can't see the bottom. Years ago, you'd be able to see the bottom and individual sponges and whatnot. To the casual observer, the shallow backwaters with mangrove stands and seagrass beds are an inviting paradise. But as beautiful as it appears, for Di Maria, it's not what it used to be. Mainly the dead coral. Most of the reef has died off. The water quality has gotten worse. Visibility has certainly gotten much worse. A lot of algae, of course, lack of fish too. But it's all, I don't think any of the changes I've seen have been for the good. For a commercial fisherman, the picture Don paints is troubling. Fishing is a way of life in the Florida Keys and across the state. People come from around the world just to fish in Florida waters. The U.S. holds a total of 2,816 world game fish records. Florida counts for more than 900. Fishing is a major economic player. According to Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission statistics, recreational fishing has an economic impact of nearly $14 billion and supports 120,000 jobs. Commercial fishing brings in another $3.2 billion and supports more than 75,000 jobs. Can, they, can you make a living still, though, fishing commercially? Yeah, you, you can. It's, it's you know, not going to get rich. But it's just, it's just most of them are just are barely hanging on. You see a lot of the guys selling out now, particularly the lobster fishermen. Florida's commercial fishermen harvest 80 million pounds of shrimp, stone crab, lobster, and blue crab annually. In the Keys, the big ticket catches are lobster and stone crab. If lobster and stone crabs crash, that's it. Fish houses are out of business. That's, there's nothing else that will keep them in business. Don will be the first to tell you what he and other fishermen see is not scientific. It's anecdotal, based on decades of experience. In most places around Florida, fish remain abundant. But there are warning signs. The Indian River Lagoon on Florida's east coast is one of them. It stretches 156 miles. The lagoon was once one of the state's finest fisheries. Not anymore. What used to be a lush bottom covered in seagrass is in most places barren. With months left to go this year, more manatees, 800, have already died in Florida than ever before. With no seagrass to eat, scientists believe most of the manatees starved to death. There are a multitude of human sins that have brought us to this point. Wastewater, human sewage, fertilizers, all making their way into the ocean's rivers and the Indian River Lagoon, increasing nitrogen levels. As a marine biologist, I keep telling you know, my students and, and future marine biologists that the oceans, the seas, are the dumping recipients of everything on land, in the rivers. Ralph Turingen is a marine biologist at the Florida Institute of you Technology in Melbourne, Florida. Way. The impact of what amounts to human dumping is being dramatically amplified, he says, by climate change. What happens with the deterioration of the habitat is you, you're, you, you're eliminating those different structures that different fish would utilize. And so when those structures are no longer there, you lose those populations. They go to where they can survive better. That's exactly what happens, says Florida Atlantic University marine biologist you know Brian LaPointe. What we, we have been saying for years, uh, this nutrient over enrichment problem that kills seagrasses and coral reefs, no habitat, no fish. No habitat, no manatees. Would you say, based on the last five years since we talked last, the lagoon is in any better shape today than it was five years ago? I would say the lagoon ha is continuing on a downward spiral. So you're saying, wait a minute, how is climate change contributing to the downward spiral? The answer, sea level rise. Tens of thousands of homes along the lagoon have old leaky septic tanks. 
70, 80, 90% of these septic systems do not meet the state code for the separation between the drain field and the top of the seasonally high groundwater table. The lagoon is a microcosm of how sea level rise can worsen the damage humans are already creating. On a much larger scale, even seaweed is affected by climate change and an overloading of nitrogen. This is Cocoa Beach. For as far as you can see, the shoreline is covered in seaweed. It's blown ashore by high winds. It's more than just a nasty eyesore. Sea turtle nests are all along here, and the hatchlings will have a difficult time making it to the ocean through all this mess. The seaweed, or sargassum as it's known, stretches for miles north and south. A lot of people don't want to come to the beach because of the seaweed. So this is my first year here and experiencing it. Um, and it's not very pretty. Nobody wants to smell it and be walking in it. It's nasty, nasty, nasty. And it's not just here. A couple hundred miles south, this is Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys. Sargassum everywhere. We went with LaPointe to Bahia Honda State Park, not far from Key West. Oh, look at that stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's sargassum. Yeah. And you can see there's a little bit of seagrass in here. Yep. And there's uh, turtle grass, dead turtle grass blades in here. Some uh, syringodium, manatee grass. Where does it come from? This is like the eggplant that ate Chicago, right? It just grows and grows and grows and grows. And it's not likely, LaPointe says, these blooms will disappear in the years ahead. They will only get worse. Take a look at this satellite image. The red stretching from the coast of Africa across the Atlantic and through the Caribbean is a massive sheet of sargassum, 8,850 kilometers long. It is, says LaPointe, the largest harmful algae bloom on the planet, made worse, he believes, by extreme rain events linked to climate change that allow more nitrogen into the mix than ever before. If you look around the Atlantic Basin where sargassum grows, you've got major river inputs that drain the land. With all these human activities, deforestation, biomass burning, uh, Saharan dust, mm -hmm. and extreme rain events. Which are caused by climate change. Which are caused by climate change, causing massive, massive runoff uh, and flooding on these river uh, basins that comes down into the ocean and provides the key limiting nutrient nitrogen to sargassum. These are sargassum. Are, are you, um, are you worried? I am worried. Yeah, it's not looking good. Uh, when you see a bloom on this scale, um, I, I never would have predicted you know, sargassum would be so out of control as I'm seeing it today. This is beyond an eye opener even to me, um, to the point where I'm very fearful that we have put, we are pushing this planet beyond, uh, you know, a point of no return. In 2018, just cleaning off the beaches of the Caribbean cost $120 million. And this massive sargassum bloom, which is an algae, is also, LaPointe says, reducing oxygen in the water, forcing fish, if they can, to migrate elsewhere, leaving the area under the bloom a virtual dead zone. Fisheries from Florida to Texas are concerned these massive blooms could ultimately result in reduced catches as it appears to have already done in the Caribbean. We now know from data that's coming in from Barbados, from the fisheries department, that these massive blooms of sargassum are actually causing a decline in mahi-mahi fishery in Barbados and flying fish also. That's a big fishery in Barbados. Anywhere from 35 up to over 50% reduction in the fishery yield. 
Another warning sign for Florida's fishing industry lies just off the East Coast, below the surface. The world's third largest coral reef stretches 580 kilometers from Palm Beach to the Dry Tortugas, west of Key West. Born 10,000 years ago at the end of the Ice Age, scientists say only 2%, that's right, only 2% of the original coral cover remains. One of the causes, says Dr. Ralph Turingen, the warming of the oceans caused by climate change. Warm water is bad for fish because there's not enough oxygen for the fish to take in. The effect of climate change is change in water temperature, acidification, and carbon dioxide content. Those fish can escape if they have the ability to. The reef is a habitat and feeding ground for fish, so no habitat, no fish. They will, Turingen says, move if they can. But right now, there simply isn't enough science to say fish in Florida are packing their bags just yet. So there's this shifting in fisheries, right? So what used to be available to, for example, and this is hypothetical, but I'm just using an example in here that it's very familiar, right? Those fish, like tuna, for example, used to be available to the fishermen in the Philippines. Now they're no longer there. Well, did they die? Did they diminish in, in recruitment? We don't know. But one of the possibilities is they have moved to Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Different climate. That's Different right. Different water temperature. That's right. So the fish may be there, but they're no longer available to where they used to be. Does more research need to be done on this movement of fish? There are receivers in key areas along the East Coast, a lot of them in the Indian River Lagoon. What do, and then there are fish that are tagged. So we can actually trace their movement patterns by looking at the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the frequency that they ping into these receivers, this is a great tool to actually quantify how these changes that are directly caused by climate change affect the behavior of fish. The massive sargassum bloom, the record manatee deaths, dead coral caused by humans but put on steroids by climate change are beyond concerning, not just for Florida, but for the entire planet, says Brian LaPointe. Uh, I don't know how it could be more clear to all of us that um, we, we are crossing that tipping point on this planet. Don Maria is afraid LaPointe is right, but fishing and diving is his way of life. He doesn't know much else. I'm gonna hang, hang in there a few more years. I enjoy it because I'm diving. I, I still enjoy that part of it. And if I could make enough to pay bills, I'm okay. As long as there are still fish to catch, he's not going anywhere.